Now, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you loud and clear. So, good to see you, Stefan. Good to see you, Ilaria. Yeah. And uh, hi, everyone. As, as you might imagine, we are going to start in a few minutes with uh, uh, Stefan talk. Um, and uh, technology seems to work. So it's all set up. So I guess we can start. Uh, so, um, well, uh, Stefan, uh, on behalf of my lab and the Science for Life Laboratory and the Biophysics Swedish community, we are very, very thankful that you uh, accepted the invitation to speak today about your um, uh, recent development in the lab and that you took the time. And of course, it's really exciting to see how, how, how you and your team uh, advanced the, the concept of MeFlex from, from the very beginning when I was still around in Göttingen and the concept was in the air. And now you, you, you demonstrate that with very different implementation. So it's really exciting. And, and we are really looking forward to, to hear from you how, 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 how about the new date and so on. So um, I guess for, for, for the other that are watching now, the speaker of today doesn't need that many, that much introduction as a founder of the field. So uh, we can go straight away to the science. Uh, and uh, therefore I'll ask him, so I ask you, Stefan, to kindly share your screen and, and start discussing um, your methods. Thank you. Thank you, Ilaria. I hope you can see my screen well. Is that right? Yes, it's all perfect. Perfect. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, also to, um, to Erdinch. I'm going to talk about MinFlux and MinStat, which is in essence a new principle for localizing individual molecules. And of course, I will speak about the implications of this new localization principle for super resolution presence microscopy and molecule tracking. Now, usually when people think of localization of individual molecules, they have the following in mind. They think of um, an epifluorescence microscope, usually uh, that illuminates a whole field of view. And then um, uh, the molecule is somewhere shown here as this little star. But the essence is that uh, people usually have a camera. Here, the camera consists of many pixels. And what the mo molecule actually renders is a diffraction blob of diffracted fluorescence light here on the camera distributed over many pixels. And this diffraction blob, of course, um, can be evaluated, can be displayed on a, on a computer screen. And uh, you can calculate, of course, the position of the molecule by uh, just calculating the centroid of this uh, fluorescence distribution pattern. And then, of course, once you know uh, the position of this centroid with a certain precision, of course, then you can calculate back to the actual position of the molecule here in the sample. Now, this is what people refer to as localization. And they usually think that, and that's not wrong, of course, that's correct, that the, um, in the first approximation, uh, this precision with which we can, you get, of course, the position of the molecule scales inversely with the number of detected fluorescent photons, the photons that make up this diffraction pattern here. So that's the total number of fluorescent photons and now, um, this way of localizing molecules, of course, is abundantly used, and it's even used synonymously with, uh, with finding out the position of a molecule in most places. And some people even thought that this is, so to speak, um, uh, say, a kind of uh, essential feature to making super resolution images, which is, of course, not. It's the on off transition. Uh, but the point I want to make here is it has a little problem. And the problem, as we all know, um, that localization in this way has, it, it is very photon greedy. You need to maximize the fluorescence detection, the number of fluorescent photons that you get on the camera. But if you have a concept, of course, that depends on the maximization of fluorescent photons, then the problems that this concept in, 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 uh, entail uh, is actually that this photon number is definitely limited by bleaching. At some point, the molecule will go off or, or even bleach. Uh, you have to wait for, for a significant um, amount of time simply because you need large photon numbers. So it's inherently slow uh, because you need more photons and that takes more time. 
And then a problem that is sometimes underestimated, many people try to tackle it, but actually it has not been sorted out satisfactorily. The position that you get does not only depend on the number of resonant photons, it also depends on the orientation of the emission dipole with respect <clears throat> to the optical axis. And if the molecule is slightly off the focal plane, this can be a large factor like 10, 20, or even 30 nanometers or so. And so uh, you are, have a serious problem with the actual position that you get. So it's off by, by a substantial amount. Now, with these problems in mind, of course, um, we have looked into this, um, into a solution of the problem and a fundamental idea um, that uh, I actually got when after a visit to, to, to Stockholm many, many years back, sitting on the plane uh, back from, from Stockholm, Stockholm to, uh, to Frankfurt. Well, if this is the problem, of course, that you rely heavily on the fluorescent photons and, that, and those photons are limited. Why not localize with the help of the photons from the laser? Because there are zillions of photons coming from the laser and if you could use those, of course, for localizing the molecule, then of course, uh, the precision go, can go up or the speed can go up, then you're not limited by the number of photons that you need to get from the dye. And I'm explaining this principle, um, which has um, been termed uh, min flux. So in min flux, what we do is we do not have a typical, say, um, uh, epifluorescence illumination. And um, that's one difference. But the major difference is that we usually illuminate with a light pattern, a focal intensity pattern that has a zero. So a donut is the simplest case of, of, of a structured beam, so to speak, that has a zero. And the donut has a very fundamental advantage. This fundamental advantage is that it determines a coordinate in sample space. As you can see here, you can target, so to speak, a coordinate in sample space because the position where the donut is zero, of course, this is a very, very defined position. And this position can be extremely well defined because there's many photons coming from the laser and because there's many photons coming from the laser the donut pattern is extremely well defined and also and therefore also the zero is extremely well defined now how can this be used to find out where the molecule is so here again we have the star as a molecule well it's very simple the distance from of the molecule to that well-defined coordinate in sample space of course will uh, will be, uh, so to speak, encoded in the brightness of the fluorescence emission, because the closer the molecule is to, um, um, uh, to the zero of the donut, uh, the, uh, the weaker is the fluorescence. And of course, if they, do, if they coincide in space, then there is no fluorescence at all, because this is exactly where uh, the intensity of the donut is zero. So in this way, of course, we can use the fluorescent photons that are produced here by the excit excitation um, uh, due to the donut as a measure to find out where the molecule is with respect to, to the position of the donut. So we inject kind of the position um, with um, in a position in sample space using the donut and we use the fluorescence just as a way to refine um, uh, the position of the molecule with respect to the position of the donut. And this is very photon effective or very effective in terms of fluorescence photons. Why? In order to make that clear, I have introduced a little demon. And this little demon kind of knows where the molecule is. And I would like to use this little thought experiment with the demon in order to explain why this concept is so powerful and why you can save fluorescent photons and localize very, very precisely. Now, let's imagine for the moment this molecule starts moving. What will happen? The demon, knowing roughly or knowing where the molecule goes, can deflect or can shift the, the donut around in the sample space so that the zero always coincides with the position of the molecule. So the demon acts here on the beam deflector. This could be galvo or electro-optical deflectors that shift this donut beam around. But the demon, knowing that where the molecule is, can always make the zero coincide with the molecule in sample space. Now, what will happen in that case? Of course, the D1 can trace the molecule with the utmost precision. So with, say, absolute sub-nanometer precision, it will always know where the, where the molecule is just by confirming that there is no fluorescence, by the absence of fluorescence, so to speak. And this thought experiment, this Gedanken experiment, as it's called in German, tells us that we can have a very precise localization with no fluorescence emission. And you see, this is just the totally, totally opposite philosophy to the usual way of calculating the centroid of a single molecule mountain, as it's oftentimes called, yeah, or of a, of a fluorescence heaps. 
So here's the opposite. So no fluorescence emission gives the highest imaginable um, localization precision because the position that is injected by the donut in sample space coincides with the position of the fluorophore. Now, as a hand waving argument, this also leads to a, um, um, a deep independence, so to speak, of the precision on the wavelengths. And this hand waving argument is very simply uh, given well, if you just match two points, the molecule is a point, um, and of course, the zero of the donut is a point, then the wavelengths with which the donut is made doesn't really matter. This could be green light, could be red light, could be any light, as long as I'm matching the zero point with the point that makes up the molecule that represents the molecule, the wavelengths doesn't matter. So these are two things that immediately come into mind once you have fully, fully understood this concept in its, in its, in its depths. Now, in reality, of course, um, there is um, uh, no demon, of course. You do a kind of controlling electronics that measures the fluorescence. You see, it's not a camera that is placed in here. It's a point detector which has many advantages such as, uh, say, suppressing light from above and below the focal plane, so background light and so on. But in any case, we measure fluorescence that is produced here by the molecule if the molecule gets excited here by, by the donut. And now you can imagine, since the donut injects, so to speak, a, a reference coordinate in the sample plane, the fluorescence that is produced here is just indicative of, of the distance between the zero and, and the molecule you, and you need, of course, just <clears throat> you need much fewer fluorescence photons to find out that distance because the smaller distance is the fewer photons you need. And therefore, you can use, of course, these, these remaining photons. The controller, of course, or the electrons cannot be a demon that, that knows where the molecule goes, kind of detects those photons that show us how far the molecule is away from the, from the, the donut zero. And we use those photons do, um, to kind of calculate or to find out where the molecule actually is located at any given point. Again, so the coarse positioning of, of the molecule is done by, by the donut. So that's the reference coordinate. And the rest, so to speak, the, the remaining distance between that reference coordinate, coordinate which is injected by the, by the donut into the sample is then determined by the fluorescence emission. And this is, of course, very, very effective in terms of the fluorescent photon because the majority, the burden of localization is actually done with the photons from the laser, so from the, don uh, the photons that, that make up the donut coming from the laser. And this is the major difference. So you always need many photons to localize, but it's better to put the burden, the photon burden of localization on the laser and not on the fluorescent molecule because the fluorescent molecule bleaches. And this is the trick. Put the burden of having of requiring many photons on the laser. Okay, so how do we do this in practice? Um, well, let's assume this is the molecule, and um, the molecule is uh, somewhere uh, over this say distance. So this is a distance L. Um, so uh, the only thing we know at, at this point is that the molecule is somewhere between this purple and this orange uh, coordinate. Could be here, 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 or anywhere. Let's assume for the moment it is here. So how do we find out in practice? Um, where the molecule is in relationship with the donut. Well, the most simple thing of uh, most simplest way of doing it is just to scan um, uh, the, um, the donut over the molecule. And this is the intensity profile of, uh, of the donut, this one, which in first approximation is quadratic. And you see now, now once the uh, zero uh, overlaps with the molecule, the fluorescent single here is zero. So this is a fluorescent single that is produced um, if, um, if, if you scan the donut across, across the molecule. And of course here, where, there's, uh, where the zero overlaps with the position of the molecule, for essence would be zero. And then we know, of course, the position of the molecule. As a matter of fact, uh, we don't need to scan the zero across the molecule to know where it is. If we know what this function looks like, or if we know uh, um, what, what it is actually, then it's always possible to kind of uh, measure the two endpoints, okay? Especially if it's a quadratic appro approximation, it's possible to measure the two endpoints and then extrapolate from the fluorescence of the two endpoints on the position X XM. So this is a very simple way. It's a, it's a simple, say, algebraic inversion. So in this quadratic approximation. And then, of course, you get a simple equation for the position XM, which is given by the distance L, where you assume that the molecule must be located, could be 200 nanometer, could be 150 nanometer, whatever. 
divided by unity plus square root of the ratio of the two uh, values that you get, get at the position of the molecule at the two endpoints. Okay, so you don't need to scan, you just measure the fluorescence at the two endpoints. Now, this simple equation is very, very illustrative because it tells you that there is no dependence on the wavelengths in the first place. You, you see, the, you don't see any dependence on the wavelengths. And also, there is no dependence on the molecular orientation. This, I think, is a major advantage over localization by, by a camera in a usual way. Because, of course, it doesn't matter if you, if you put in a zero and you measure the, the position of the molecule respect to the zero. It doesn't matter if the molecule is oriented like this, and then you measure where it is, or if the molecule is oriented like that, or if the molecule is oriented like that. So um, in first approximation, there is a total so, um, um, independence from the molecular orientation that solves a long-standing problem of, of localization. If you calculate the, um, uh, the uncertainty, and of course there is a certain uncertainty that you, with which you get the position of the molecule, so the XM will have a certain uncertainty uh, here in one dimension, sigma X, it will still scale with the inverse of the square root of the number of fluorescent photons, so N0 plus N1 make up N, that's clear, yet the more photons you get, the more precise you are, that's not new, but the new thing is it scales linearly, and that's important, not with the square root, but linearly, with this range L. And that's very important because once you know that the molecule is say in this range, because you've done one quick measurement and you know, oh, it, it's not here, but it must be here. You can of course decrease the range and, and then search a new because you have a new smaller N and that's very effective in terms of resonant photons because L can be decreased linearly. So you have, a, you have a linear dependence, of course, not a square root dependence, meaning that meaning that um, the handle to reduce the number of total photons in order to find out where the molecule is, is to bring, of course, to reduce the L and, or in other words, to bring the zero as close as possible to the molecule, because the closer you bring it, uh, the fewer photons you need. So this is just another way of, of explaining why it's better to bring the zero close to the molecule than waiting for, for more photons. The closer it is, the fewer photons you will need. Now, in two dimensions, um, of course, um, it's not a simple equation like that, but it's not fundamentally more complicated. So in essence, um, three measurement points are enough. So, so the purple one, the red one, and the orange one, but it's always better to have a third one in the middle. Um, and so um, actually that's what we did in the very first experiment to define this concept. We used these four measurement points, then the inversion function, so to speak, uh, or the estimator to be more precise, is um, is a bit more elaborated, elaborate, but but the physics is the same. So the precision again scales linearly um, with L and inversely with the square root of the number of detected photons. And because you have this linear dependence, it's always better to zoom in on the position of the molecule once you have established a first first uh, rough position of it, rather than to wait to increase your precision based on the number of photons, as it is usually done in the normal way of localizing individual molecules. It's always better to make L small and to zoom in. Okay, so here there is a measurement showing what is the theoretically possible precision that you get given a certain expectation range L that usually starts out with the diffraction limit, say 250 nanometers or 300 or 200 or whatsoever, uh, but then you increase it, decrease it, of course, as, as you approach the molecule, say with an L of 50, which is this four, four or five times below the diffraction limit, um, uh, you have uh, a precision of 10 nanometers just with 10 photons, okay? And, and say uh, for, um, uh, say, a camera under realistic, um, um, say, conditions, you need um, uh, um, many more. And so this is, this is showing you that um, uh, this concept, of course, is very economic in terms of the fluorescent photons. Why? Because it puts the photon burden of localization on the laser photons. You, as I said, you always need many photons to localize, but, but here the majority of the workload or a large, majority, a large part of the workload is done by the photons from the laser, making up the donut, of course. Okay, so again, as I said, it's always better to reduce L than to wait for, for, uh, for more photons. And, and this is what's indicated here in this view graph. Okay, um, so, so zoom down, that's, that's the essence. 
Of course, you can use this localization principle for tracking molecules. So if a molecule moves around, then, then you can kind of um, uh, quickly move around. Usually it's done electro-optically, so not with a Galvo scanner. So electro-optically, you can basically inertia free uh, uh, move, move the beam around very, very quickly in the microsecond domain. And, um, and then uh, you can make traces. Um, this is uh, uh, actually done in cooperation with Johan Elf from Uppsala. Um, uh, a very first demonstration that, that you can get 8,000 localizations per second um, and uh, sort of, so to speak, uh, a record uh, tracking speed, in this case of the ribosome subunit labeled with um, an activatable GFP MEOS. Okay, now um, if you want to take images, not just tracking, um, then of course you need your on off. As I said in the beginning, so the key and the foundation of all these super resolution methods, whatever that is, stat, palm, storm, paint, and so on, you need a way to separate flow of force that are closer than the diffraction barrier. And the standard way of doing it at this point of development, basically done by all labs, is some sort of on off transition. So if this molecule is on, the other one is off, and this is why you can separate them. So in order to take images with this localization concept, of course, you need an on off transition. And let's assume this would be the object and the stars are the molecules um, uh, kind of decorating the object. You need just in the diffraction zone, one molecule that is on. So, so you need the on off. So this one is on and then turn you turn it off, of course. So it has to go off and you turn on the next and then turn on the next and, and, and turn off again and so on. And this way you can make a picture as it is also done in Palm Storm, molecule by molecule. But this time not with localizing the centroid of a mountain as it is usually explained but by, say, going around with the donut and finding the position of the molecule in a very fluorescent photon economic way. Now, um, this is a, a cartoon showing an array of molecules on, a, uh, say, this was uh, Alexa 647, which is a switchable molecule um, arranged on a DNA structure called origami. And um, usually with, um, with palm storm, and this is a simulation here, and the realistic conditions, ideal, so to speak, camera, you cannot take them apart with bin flux. You can, you can resolve them. Why? Because the resolution is better in the end. So the separation is on a single molecule basis. This is fantastic in both cases. But here, you localize with the same number of photons, you localize much more precisely. This is another example in a, a case of six nanometers. Uh, again, the simulated palm storm for the same number of photons here for the practical situation where we have, of course, also noise uh, to some extent, uh, Minflux is able to tell those molecules apart. So keep in mind that this is all done with uh, objective lenses. And I can tell you, and many of you, of course, will not remember those days, but I can tell you in, in, in the early 90s, when I started out saying, oh, in the end, um, one will be able to see, say, uh, um, the objects um, in fluorescence microscopy, at the nanometer scale with regular objective lenses. I mean, this was totally crazy. As a matter of fact, in those days, people believed that you have to squeeze the light through tiny, um, through tiny fibers. Um, it was called near-field optics. And Eric Betzig actually championed that field. And many, many groups, dozens of groups in the world went to, to pulling fibers and to confining the light onto a tiny tip. But uh, this has not worked out, as we all know, but, but the far field obviously has worked out. And I'm very pleased, I must say, uh, this is very fulfilling, um, say, uh, situation to see that this has really worked out. And that for floor for that can be switched on off on an individual basis, of course, the molecule scale optical resolution has been reached, full stop, this has been reached. And this was not with near field optics, but with regular focused beams. So beams that are purely diffracted um, and, um, and so you can have microscopes that look like microscopes, not like something that has a fiber or so. Now, why was that possible in MinFlux? Because MinFlux requires fewer detections, and that's one thing. Also, at the same time, you're faster, so there's less drift. If you have palm storm, you need more photons, there's more drift. And, and of course, you have the orientation problem, the emission diaper problem, that also destroys, to some extent, your precision. Um, so these are the three factors that really uh, uh, have led actually to this conceptual advancement in the optical resolution of fluor force, say, which, which now is at the molecular scale. Of course, those who do biology say, okay, what does this mean for me? 
well, I mean, it's very clear. If you take a picture of something that is, so to speak, biological and you use fluorophore as labels, you have to keep in mind, and this is really important and cannot repeat it often enough, that fluorescence microscopy images nothing but the fluorophore. I repeat it, nothing but the fluorophore. Even if you have a resolution of five nanometers or three or six or seven, it doesn't image microtubules, it doesn't image the crystal in the mitochondria, it doesn't image DNA or base pairs on DNA, because fluorescence microscopy cannot image DNA base pairs simply because they do not fluoresce, okay? Or give not, do not give enough fluorescence. What you see is just the fluorophore that is attached somehow to what you wanna see. And so the ideal, say, fluorescence image, no matter what, what um, method it is, and of course, and Minflux gives sort of ideal fluorescence images by now, looks like this. These are the fluorophores, and of course the image will look like this. There's no other way of, of rendering what, what you have because it just renders the floor for. So if you have a spatial resolution of five nanometers in your system, this is what it will be like. And if you can separate molecules at five nanometer distance, you will separate them because the resolution is five nanometers. But it doesn't mean that you see the crystal. Why? Because they're not labeled. It's, it's that simple. And so if you want to see the crystal, of course, you have to do the molecules there because the only thing the, the microscope sees is the molecules, full stop. So if you put the molecules here, you may see more, of course, you will see more, and then the image will look like this. But again, you don't know what's going on here or here or here because there's no label. So this is something that, that has to be very clear. One must not confuse, of course, the optical resolution, which is now is at the molecular limit with the possibility to, to see something because the seeing of all these structures requires the labeling. So what I'm saying here is the limit no longer is the optical imaging, Thanks God, this has been the notion for many, many, many decades. As a matter of fact, the limit is the labeling. And if you want, in my view, make a fundamental stride in this field or get a Nobel prize in this field, do something about the labeling because this is the big unsolved problem at this point. And as a matter of fact, probably the only serious limit of getting fantastic images of, I don't know what, DNA and the rest of it. Okay, now having said that, um, uh, at the time we published a paper in, in science, of course, we had a very small field of view and people questioned whether we can take large field of view. But I tell you, if a principle is strong, the technological problems can be sorted out, um, that they will be sorted out and there is an incentive to sort them out. And of course, we have sorted out the large field of view imaging and one way of doing it is to scan, of course, across the field of view and then take a, take a picture of, um, of what we see by localizing individual molecules. And, and so this is um, done in, um, in collaboration uh, with uh, um, Jan Ellenberg and Jonas Sees from EMBL who brought samples to us. And then um, we thought, oh, wow, the localization that we get here on this uh, nuclear pore uh, complex, NAP96 in this case, is really good. So it's 0.9 nanometer, what was the median uh, localization. And um, to, be, to have a very conservative estimate. So of course, on, on the resolution, of course, the resolution would be something of that order if the molecules can be switched individually, that's very clear. You also made a Fourier ring correlation that also takes into account jitter or something like that or drift uh, because the recording of this image was on the long side. It was many tens of minutes or so with a large field of view, um, uh, more than half an hour and so on. And then of course you can have that. And so we did the Fourier ring correlation and but still the resolution conservative estimate is below three nanometers that means it is indeed uh, at the molecular scale and if you zoom in of course um, there is all reasons to believe that individual say localization so localization or localization groups or so that you can that you can see in here can be associated with molecules um, with fluorescent molecules nothing else very clear the labeling determines what you actually see and this is clearly definitely much better than um, uh, what you have instead, of course, for that matter, or confocal, there's order of magnitude in between, and arguably right now, probably the best images that, um, that there are, so to speak, in far field fluorescent microscopy, at least we think, um, based on evidences that we have reached the, the molecule scale resolution limit for seeing the floor force attached, uh, in this case, to nuclear pore complexes. Now I would like to, to, um, um, to, to spend a few moments on the way these localizations have been identified, 
Okay, this is a very, very important point. It's all explained in the supplements in our paper, but some people don't read it or they don't care reading it. And so I would like to explain how this is done and why do we have the confidence that we have a, a molecule scale resolution in here. Now, keep in mind, the way we localize is the following. So this is a molecule. And then uh, what will happen is that we zoom in on the molecule. And then ideally, the, the center point, the blue point of this, say, measurement tri um, triangle, if you will, gets very close to the molecule. Then we have a good localization, of course. But every now and then, it can happen that it goes astray, you know, because, you know, the algorithm, the way we iterate on the molecule, zoom in on the molecule, um, doesn't work for some reason. And then there is a large distance between the molecule and the center of, of um, uh, actually of this pattern. So where, when the donut is right here. And that would be, of course, um, 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 a bad localization here. So, so rel this re our relative distance is small, of course, as you would anticipate, and here it is large. So this would be good and this would be bad. And this was a way how we discriminate the localization. So we didn't discriminate the localization based just on brightness as palm storm people do, but in the fourth iteration, after we knew, okay, there is a molecule that has a certain brightness, this was the way the localization was discriminated. And this is of course very arbitrary, this is even handed, this is not biased or anything, this is very, very the way it should be. And you see now what the distributions look like here, these are the good localizations because these are relatively small. You see it's close to zero. And here, those were the bad localizations because here the iteration concept didn't work. So those, the red ones were discarded. So this, this is the, those that were discarded and those were left. And this is very justified and very fair. Of course, there's another way of finding out if the iteration worked, um, not just measuring the distance, but the brightness of the signal that you get from the blue point, because the blue point is in the center. And ideally, the, the the, the molecule is close to the center, the signal that you get from the blue point when the donut is at the blue point must be lowest. Okay, if the molecule is further away, then it doesn't matter if you measure here, here or here, it will be about the same. And this is this, this is shown in here. And you see here very nicely that um, um, in this case, you see where the good localizations are, this say brightness um, from, the, from the zero, the relative brightness, the normalized number of counts is called, it's low, it's very low. And here, uh, the bad localization, so to speak, it is, it, is, um, uh, it is almost, say, equal, because if you divide this 4.1 by 4, you end up with 0 0.25. And you see, this is 0 0.25. So this is, this is how we looked at these distributions, of course. And we saw, OK, those must be associated with something where um, uh, the localization didn't converge. So those were discarded. And those where we found the localization converging, of course, they were kept. It's, it's, it's a very logical way of, of doing it. And, um, um, and of course, I would like to mention, this is also important. In this case, where, where you have, say, equal brightnesses for all measurement points, it could also be noise. Doesn't mean that we discarded a molecule in here. It could, or, or, or it could be due to noise or something. Because, of course, this kind of way of iterating tries to catch something. And then, of course, you may be you may be catching noise, so to speak. And this, this doesn't mean that molecules were discarded. If you look at, as a matter of fact, at a distribution, only little was discarded, but there is in the fourth iteration, again, in the fourth iteration, there is no capping by brightness, as some people say, this is not true. And on these very rigorous selections, so to speak, of the localization based on, on algorithms that are really arbitrary, we got this data. This is why we think we have a reliable way of, of getting high localization data and this high precision. This is why this is data that, that will be, in my view, is, is a seminal. Okay, so again, there is no information whatsoever based on prior object information in this piece of data. There is no information whatsoever that this is a nuclear pore. It's not that we want to see nuclear pores, we get nuclear pores. This is the way it was filtered, full stop. Now with that, I'm thanking the people who have, say, contributed to this development, have gone through all the details that, that I've just explained right now. Unfortunately, Klaus, Yvonne, Yasmin have left academia, but Francisco is going on at a IMP in Vienna, and I'm sure new interesting things will come out from his lab as well. So um, 
The next point that was left uh, from my viewpoint was, can this mean flux be realized with a standard microscope stand and developed for routine use? Because people said, oh, you know, I remember the development of steady it took ages until people could use it. No, it's not going to take ages. And the precautions I've taken, I've set up uh, with my say, former students, um, a company, I'm uh, making a disclaimer right now, I have shares of this company, Avera Instruments. And of course, I convinced them to develop this microscope for routine use. And of course, the big question that comes up is, can it be done with a microscope stand? Can you do this or do you have to have a special person that, that, jockey, that jockeys this, these microscopes, given that it has so many requirements, of course, and the stability? Um, actually, I convinced everyone, and these are people from the company, so the orange ones, they are, as I said, my former students. So actually, this person, in fact, is my student still. I was involved, of course, in sort of, um, uh, say, guidance of, of the project and definition and um, and it's coming out in nature communications in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks and so the layout is open there's a bunch of supplement information there is no secrets about it um, you can all read it and and see what what has been actually done now the key is this is on a microscope stand this here is a microscope stand and um, and it's done also in 3d you can do 3d um, recordings so 3d pictures um, contrary to the paper we published in Nature Matters here, a deformable mirror was used for doing um, the 3D iteration. You see here, not, not electro-optic um, uh, moving uh, lens. This has advantages, more robust and, and so on. And, uh, and um, uh, the point that I'm making here that tests of stability, and this was not clear, I must say, showed that you can keep the sample relative to the stand with very high precision of a long period of time, two hours. Here, somebody may have slammed the door, or I don't know what happened here. It's very hard to say, but you see the sigma is, is uh, sigma x in this case, and the same applies for y and, and for z is below four nanometers. So the company actually managed, the people here, so uh, Roman Schmidt and Tobias Weiss, to be precise, they managed to make it very stable. And so this has become useful, and I'm showing you pictures done in 3D. Um, so this is an overview, of course, um, a sort of confocal overview, I'm zooming in on the, again on the nuclear pores, NAP96. And, um, and you can get now a feel for, for the three-dimensionality uh, of this data. And the point I'm making here is in Z, the localization precision is 1.6. And this is really fantastic, given that it uses just a single end. So it's not using like a, a four pi type of arrangement or so, just with a single lens, 1.6 nanometer. X and Y 2.2 is not as good as the say high end that, that I've shown before, but this is not so surprising because it uses a 3D donut. You must not compare two dimensional data with data that were taken with a three dimensional donut. Of course, if you use such a three dimensional donut, there's more noise in it, um, then the convergence is not so good and so on, but still it is, it is very good. I mean, Sigma of 2.2 and um, in X and Y and, and Z 1.6 uh, is fantastically good, but this is not, so the end of the development, uh, I'm just showing you, this can be done in 3D and even under commercial setting so that it's useful with um, say such a, a pattern. Of course, um, you can also measure um, a diffusion. Here, um, um, lipid molecules diffusing the lipid bilayers have been measured. So a sigma of 13 nanometers of localization done within 234 microseconds, 12,000 hours localization in total. Um, you can be even faster if you will. So if you relax the sigma here, it's 29 meters with 117 microseconds per localization, so, uh, 33,000 um, uh, localization total. I think, especially for molecular dynamics, there is no, I mean, this is this is really, um, I won't say no competition, but, but it's really totally outstanding because you get into a realm of molecular movements that is not accessible uh, with, in my view, any other method um, without say, using beads and something like that, just labeled molecules. Okay, now, so where is the limit? The conceptual limit in my view is you need 10 microseconds in the end for one nanometer precision within 10 nanometer, 10 nanometer range, which is bold of course, but I think it's reachable. Uh, it's, it's not, we are not there yet, but I think it's possible. Keep in mind one nanometer precision that is of the order of of, um, of the molecule itself, fluorophore itself. Uh, optical resolution of fluorophores is of course molecular, depending on the background, depending on the noise, uh, depending on, 
uh, all kind of circumstances. It's not just one resolution. Of course, it depends on, on, on the floor four and on the sample background, but it's reachable. Uh, we have shown first evidences for that, and for sure um, there will be more coming. This is going to stay and is going to, to evolve and going to be extremely useful. So coming sort of to the end of my talk, um, a big question comes up. Everyone knows I'm a stat person. So what about stat? Is now stat totally useless? I haven't mentioned a single word about stat. The contrary is the case. I would even say that arguably the big times of stat are about to come. Why? I'm explaining to you why. I'll give you the arguments for that. Of course, most of you know what a stat microscope looks like. You have, you have an excitation beam, then you have the stat being converted to a donut, you have an APD. Okay, now what we did is actually we equipped um, uh, the, uh, the stat beam with an electro optical deflector in here. And here we had a galvo in case we move the beam, the XY beam, too strongly so that we can still match uh, the signal actually to, um, uh, to, the, um, to the APD detector. And also, what is actually in here is um, um, uh, the, uh, another beam for, for excitation, but that's, that's a detail. Stat, you know, there is an excitation beam, there is a stat beam shaped as a donut, and of course the stat beam, and that's, that's so to speak, a characteristic of stat, the targets a coordinate in sample space. Namely, the zero of the, of the stat donut defines very precisely the region in which the molecules are still allowed to emit, because here, where the donut beam is strong enough, there is no fluorescence, there is zero fluorescence, there's nothing, nothing coming back. Now keep in mind, min flux, of course, was about having a point with zero fluorescence. And so instantly the question comes up, can we use the zero fluorescence zone, so to speak, in order to kind of do something like min flux, but with the stat beam? And of course, taking advantage of the fact that the stat beam injects a coordinate in sample space that is very well defined. And the solution of that, or the outcome of that, was the concept mean stat, which is related, of course, with mean flux. And I'm going to show you what, um, what the, say, the benefits of this concept are, the fundamental advantages. Now, let's imagine we, want, we have a molecule here, and we want to localize this molecule. Now, if you want to do something with stat similar to mean flux, we can use this effective PSF and kind of move it around here to form a donut. It won't be a donut because it will be moving. And I'm showing you here now. If you move it around quickly, it looks like a donut. It's not a donut because there's nothing on the opposite side. There's always such a EPSF, so to speak, at the same time. But we can meander, so to speak, very, very circulate very quickly this EPSF, this region of allowed fluorescence around the molecule. And as soon as we get signal, we move it away and kind of encapsulate it or kind of engulf it in such a way that the circle center, of course, ideally in the end coincide with the position of the molecule. And that way we can localize the molecule. So circulating EPSF em emulates an excitation donut with um, central zero. And this is the idea behind mean step. And what is also important is that the donut is sharpened up and narrowed down uh, in radius with increasing step beam power. So as, as when, once, we, once we go here along, so to speak, uh, um, with time, of course, we sharpen up um, uh, the donut beam. Now you may say, okay, if you increase the stat beam power, oh, this is terrible, it may, we may bleach the dye. No, it's not going to happen. Why? Because this is done in such a way that you see here, the donut is, is of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of the stat beam is low. It's done um, in such a way that the molecule kind of sees only or notices only the intensities of the donut where the donut is low. So so the set, set people would say where the, the stat is linear, not in the saturated regime, in the linear regime, there were there's maybe 50% or 30% de-excitation, but not 100% de-excitation. And in this way, of course, um, the bleaching by the stat beam is kept low because, because the molecule sees only weak, weak intensities. Now, um, so as I said, there is little bleaching, although the, the stat power is increased, and also the region where the stat, bow, stat beam is stronger doesn't matter because the molecules are off. They are deactivated, they are insensitive. It's not that, that those molecules would see that stat light. They won't see it simply because they're inactivated. You need to activate the molecule first in order to make it susceptible to light. So since only one molecule is activated if you do imaging and for the localization, there's no molecule around here, of course, um, it doesn't matter. And this is of course very powerful because it brings 
a number of advantages, as a matter of fact, over min flux. As we found, and you can dissipate to some extent, is the step bit keeps the background low. And if you ask me what is, so to speak, the limitation of min flux, the limitation of min flux is set by the background. It's very clear because in the end, if you do the iteration as explained, um, if you have background, you don't know where to go. You don't know how to localize, of course. And, um, and of course, molecules um, that, um, that emit only a few photons and the, at the same time there's background are harder to localize. It's, it's not possible to bring the zero close to the molecule because the localization doesn't work anymore. Moreover, of course, if you bring the zero close to the molecule in min flux, you have to crank up the power of the stead donut. That makes it even larger and potentially excites stuff around it and makes background. And that is a problem. And, but instead, it's, or it means that it's totally the opposite because if you crank up the stead beam, the stead beam suppresses background. It doesn't matter. Whereas the excitation rate, the excitation beam remains constant. So the fluorescence flux remains constant. So you can keep constant fluorescence flux, even though you can find, the, you can find of course, the EPSF. So you make your scanning range or your L or whatever you want, want to call it smaller. At the same time, you keep the excitation rate the same and keep the background low. And this is a major advantage of min flux. I'm not saying that uh, this is better than min flux or something because it requires a stat beam. It requires a molecule that can be activated and of course used for stat at the same time. But it's a very, very powerful concept. And this is actually shown here in this measurement. Um, here you see that with 100 photons, you get precision of the order of yeah three nanometers or so um, uh, with 200 photons, yeah? Just 200 photons. You get a sigma of of, of two nanometers. This is this is not bad. This is way, way below what people have to use in Palm Storm. And of course, you don't have the year orientation problem. So these are the people actually who have, um, have developed this in the lab. Of course, uh, Michael Weber and Marcel Oyen going through all, all the, the subtleties of doing the circulation, looking which is best and, and what is um, uh, ideal. And of course, also uh, Michael actually um, and Marcel did those measurements and, this, and these calculations. So this is a, a big acknowledgement uh, to their contribution to this concept. But finally, I mean, um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, you have um, a, a, a minstead image uh, that, that is really decent here. Um, you see very nice localizations um, and um, it's all um, nicely localized to give you the uh, numbers, sigma 2.1 in median at um, uh, say 1200, uh, 1300 counts. Um, this is not bad uh, for the beginning. And it's all written up actually in a, in a preprint that some of you may have seen. It's coming out in Nature Photonics in, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Now, one advantage of Minstat, and, 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 and I would say the three of us, uh, Michael, Marcel, and, and I are very excited about this concept. One advantage of Minflux is that um, um, you can also tune the resolution. And so, this is a very nice recording that, that uh, Michael actually took. So this is confocal. Uh, this is stat and means that you can, you can kind of tune the spatial resolution from confocal down to stat and, and finally to the molecular scale. I'm not aware of any other concept that really uh, actually bridges the, the whole distance from confocal to, to basically molecular, molecular scale resolution. At the same time, um, uh, the background is low. Why? Because it's done with stat. This is this is really important, and so so I think uh, Stat um, has now um, has definitely a great future, and this is something that that will you will certainly hear more about in in the future. But in essence, since most of you know that I like concepts and I spend a lot of my time thinking about concepts, so that that would that that's what what I would like to convey at this point. If you didn't understand anything, you don't care about the details. Targeting emitter with a light intensity minimum, as such as a donut, is a new and fundamental localization concept with major implications for super resolution signal molecule tracking. It's not that there is just a fluorescent mountain you calculate a centroid. And as I said, this is not a key of super resolution. If it was a key of super resolution, I couldn't have shown images here because I've not used that at all. Okay, so this is this is now a new localization concept which is in my view, better than, than this molecule mountain uh, thing. And why, or what's the idea behind it? 
don't ask the dye to give you the photons for the localization. Ask the laser to provide the localization photons. Why? Because the laser has plenty of them. And it's better to use the laser for localization than to use the dye. And this is the point why it works. So again, in my view, this is a very strong concept. And in the end, after development, of course, there are a number of things that you have to look into, like the, the best way of, um, of identifying the molecular localizations and so on. But in the end, strong concepts always yield strong methods. And this is basically the last thing um, uh, that, that I would like to point out at this point. And with that, I'm um, thanking you, of course, for listening and happy to take questions, Hilaria. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, it, it was really, really great. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Sure. So uh, I'd like to start uh, because, um, yeah, as you know, I share your um, your enthusiasm for concept. So I see now the mean flux and the mean stat. And when and when I think of that and I think about the data, is uh, the, somehow like when you get a molecule in in a mean flux, I understood that you know you get are in the crystal of the donut and you get more photon and then you get to the center, you get less photon. In mean stat, it somehow seems the opposite. It's sort of flipped even if the concept is, uh, is the same. So how these two type of data, for example, deal with background, would they like face the same challenges or, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. I mean, this, I mean, of course, also the normal localization is cha challenged by background. That's very clear. And this is why people use turf when they use a camera localization and so on. Um, it's very clear that, cha that in the end, you're uh, limited by, by localization. Um, that applies, of course, also to min uh, limited by by noise. So this is also by background noise. This applies um, uh, to um, to min flux. It applies also to min stat. The fundamental difference between the two is that um, uh, in min flux, if you zoom in on the molecule, uh, it, because the, the, you bring the zero closer to the molecule, um, in order not to have to wait too long, of course, um, in order to get enough photons, so the fluorescent photons per, per unit time. What you do is you crank up the power, okay? But if you crank up the power to get more signal, which is which is legitimate and fine, yeah, then um, you can argue that the donut increases. Of course, donut becomes stronger, and then of course more, say, kind of whatever molecules from the outside could also be some sort of scattering or nonlinear scattering, whatever, um, <clears throat> can contribute, of course, to the signal that you have in the detector, and that has put a limit actually to the smallest. L or to the closest distance that you can that you can um, position your your pattern on a molecule. And if you look into the data, the data I've, that I talked about in detail has an L of fifty. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't make sense, or it was not possible because of noise to to bring it much closer. Okay. And of course, if you if you have uh, say some things in a, in a, in a, in a cell that has more background. The L is even larger, it could be 80 or 100. If you look into our papers for, for the proteins, it was even larger or so. And then you cannot benefit as much from, from, the, from the, say, min flux concept than you like, or it compromises to some, some extent the resolution that you get or the precision that you get. Still, is way better than Palm Storm, no doubt about it. But, but you don't get to that sigma of 0 0.9, but you have, um, as we have, so we're in the two color images or something, sigma of 2.2 or, 2 or 3.2 or something. So it's worse. The same applies if you do 3D. Um, yeah, then you don't localize the uh, the excitation so well. Again, you have you have more noise. Um, so so that's that's very clear that this is putting a limit. This can be sorted out by playing all, all kind of tricks and making it better, and and using better dyes that are specialized for min flux, which we haven't used. I'm not saying that Alexa is the best dye, of course not, um, that, that's very clear. Why did we use Alexa 647? Because we didn't want to do two experiments at the same time. And we knew, um, we knew that this is a dye that gives enough photons to, to, to develop the concept. But it doesn't mean this is the best dye for min flux, of course. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's good enough to find out what is the precision that you can achieve and so on, because it gives you enough photons, gives you time. So this is another challenge. Minstead, how does Minstead compare? Uh, because the, the EPSF is sharpened up by cranking up the donut, of course. This is a plus. This is a clear plus. Because the stent donut, as we have seen so far, at least with this wavelength, suppresses, keeps the background low. So if you zoom in on the molecule, you do not crank up the background, so to speak, relatively. 
but you keep it even low or even suppress it. This is this is very nice, um, meaning that you can use smaller L's, so to speak. You can go closer to molecules. In fact, we use something like 30 nanometers or so. And the background at the final iteration step is one over eight or even higher. Whereas the influx is one over two. So, so there is um, um, uh, so there's a clear benefit of, of doing it with the stat beam. But as I said, it adds complexity because it adds another beam, which is the stat beam. But in the end, both concepts are going to stay uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. OK, uh, so then um, um, also on this line, um, uh, so since we are like you mentioned photophysics and so on, do you think that uh, like if you are talking, for example, with a um, probe engineer and so on and, and uh, like to, to get better uh, probe with mean flux. So uh, if we think about what what is still challenging in the photophysics, like what would happen if, for example, the uh, molecule would blink uh, during this uh, triangulation or something like that? How, how do we handle this? Then you would lose it if it blinks off too much. Yeah, okay. then, then you lose it, and, and uh, of course, um, some some in some cases it happened. Then then of course those molecules were discarded because you couldn't localize it. Of course, then then it's off somewhere. That's that's very clear. Um, there are several ways of dealing with that. Um, I think one has to take better advantage of the concept because the concept in the end needs fewer photons, mm -hmm. and then also has the chance of of catching a. Uh, so time period in which it is on. And then if it goes off sooner, it doesn't matter because you have already your 500 photons or so. This is something that has to be worked on. So we look in, into this detail. This will depend on the molecule. But of course, yes, if there is a blinking event that is serious, of course, and, and the blinking time is too long, then there is a mislocalization. And um, um, of course, if you if you if you go like this and make a photon by photon decision, as it is done in the MinSTAT implementation, which also can be done in MinFlux, it hasn't been done yet, but it can equally be done in MinFlux. Then, arguably, you have you have more reliability because you're doing a photon by photon decision. So, in my personally, my I think um, my tendency is to think that that the photon by photon decision is superior. Also, but for fundamental reasons, but we will see. Also, for min flux, so, so I, I think very unlikely that the three points are going to be the end of the story. Or so this, you know, if you develop something, you have to start somewhere, and you have to try it out in one way until you understand what what is possible, what not, and then with time, of course, things are refined and it's getting better, and 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 so on, and um, and this this is this is happening. But again, uh, once you have a system implemented, so I'm talking about, let's assume the commercial system, it has all the electric optics implemented. Of course, you can change that scanning pattern. And if your new die is coming, you can adapt that pattern to the new die, no problem. But you need, you need that um, electro optics and the rest of it. And there's of course, elaborate engineering. This cannot be done by any lab. And this is why I'm happy that it's commercialized because then people can have access and try it out themselves. Right. In fact, there was a related question in the chat. It was saying, of course, uh, we know that you are like try to get the best technology to get the best data as possible. Uh, but of course, there, there, there could be. So the question is, there could be in the future, like simplified version of MinFlux that could still work. And, and especially the electro optical scanner or and so, around that. Yeah. Or, could, be, could be the case. But, um, but um, uh, say the systems that are available are now very elaborate, I must say. Of course, it could be simplified at some point, and, and, and they will be simplified. I'm 100% sure, because um, with time you will learn what is really essential and what is not essential. But if you build something from scratch, as you know very well, Ilaria, uh, you 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 take precautions for all kind of possible problems, and then it turns out that is not a problem, so you discard those. Of course, it will become less complex. Of course, it will become more. Uh, cheaper and of course it will become um, a more say, versatile. I, I have no doubt about it. But I'm very happy that the proof has been made, if you will, independently from us, that this is something that is viable. Yeah, it's yeah. viable and it, it's limited basically by the labeling and nothing else. It's limited by the labeling. It's not the optics, and yeah. the same result in the labs of Abierio. It's limited by the dye. It's not limited by 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 the scanning, by the optics, by by the rest of it yeah so so uh in fact talking about the dye i mean i understood that so the perfect dye would be a dye that is still photoactivatable but then it can either be depleted very efficiently or, or photosable uh, that's always 
uh, the requirement. But then thinking about that, um, of course, in Resolve, there are similar requirements, right? We want also there to have a photochromic protein or something to switch many times. But we always place the attention on the number of switching cycle. So am I right if I think that that's whole for Resolve, but not necessarily for MinFlux? Exactly. Or that exactly, because you need, um, you want to have it off first, and you want to have it on, and goes off, and that's it. Because um, uh, unless you want to take an image again, of course. But, but if you just want to localize it um, once, just on off one off state and on state again off activate measure bleach gone and then you have your picture um uh, i think this is this is this is what you need so so what is the requirement for for min what is the best min flux die i mean um it is something that can be switched on activated if you like spits out a number of hundred uh, several hundred counts or so for a perfect localization or a sigma, say one to three, four, five nanometers localization, then it goes off and that's it. And, and it should be done uh, uh, with lasers, of course, that generate very little background in, in the cell. Yeah. All right. So I, I'll read you the question in the chat. So, and other things that maybe help also clarify the method because the concept is new. So people, of course, always try to uh, refer to what has been around for a while. Um, so, so in palm and storm, and like in localization in general, it's a must to have one molecule in uh, in order to to gain resolution. So we can work with double events. They are usually discarded with more like different type of filters. In mean flux, what happens if two molecules pop up at the same time? Yeah. I mean, if you don't do any, um, so in also in Pan, I mean, people have worked on this. You can have two if you if you find out it's two, mm -hmm. and you can um, then can you match, so to speak, or you can estimate their position based on the signal of of two molecules, of course. But you need to know it's two, so you have to find out. The same for minflux. In in principle, you need only one. That's clear because if you have two, you will the minflux localization will not work. It will go astray, and you will have bad localizations, as I've shown. To go astray, or or it may might catch one of them, but again, it won't, won't be precise. But of course, you can come up with a concept or with a localization con a concept, a minflux concept, or minflux iteration that is able to identify that two molecules are on, based on the on the counts that you get or or the fluctuations that you have, and then sort of um, uh, calculate or estimate where the two molecules are. And then you can localize two at the same time. This was done actually um, in, in Palm Storm as well, where people, they, I don't know what they called it, but, but they had two or three or something at the same time. And then they kind of made a um, maximum likelihood estimation, or whatever, in order to estimate where the two or three are at the same time. So the same thing can be done in, in MinFlux. I would think even better because um, um, if, or means that, because if you suppress background, of course, then then um, it's good. So I think another I didn't mention it, uh, but one of the I, I talked about background a lot. But keep in mind, since it's a confocal system, the background still is very low. I mean, we are we we have a big advantage of of localizing um, with a strongly back, background suppressing system, namely the confocal system. So I can imagine, uh, say, um, a big application field of of mean flux, and of course also means that in areas where you have a lot of scattering or so, because you can, where palm or storm would never go because, because you don't have the means of suppressing background, say deeper into us, into a layers of cells or, or even tissue or something. Um, I think there is a, there's a lot of potential for exploring that. Yeah. So, and, and another question that come to my mind is that now you're filling this gap, right? In resolution, you're moving from 30 nanometer down to very few nanometers. So you are uh, finally sort of matching imaging data with what, uh, like with information that we recorded before with, for example, FRAT or foster, yeah, um, yeah. foster radius. So um, my question is like, do you see that in your data? Do the molecules start talking to each other somehow? And, and do you think if there are way to actually, instead of seeing that as a problem, because that, as you said, will be solved at some point with different tricks uh, or labeling yeah. as, as an advantage, either to make FRAT more precise yeah. or, or, or so on. Yeah. I mean, we have seen that fleetingly, but I'm, I'm saying this as sort of, um, well, in, I cannot definitely say that this is, this is the case. In theory, you should anticipate that if this is off and this is on, okay? So this is off and this is on, um, there should be no interaction between the two even if they are three nanometers close, because, because this doesn't absorb because it's off. Only this one um, uh, is on. Uh, but you never know. 
it could also happen that off is not really off. Uh, and I think this is, in, in my view, this is an idealized state off because it may come back for a brief moment of time, make like this, and then turn on for a brief moment of time. And then something may happen. And then they can speak with each other. I, I'm sure this, such things will happen. Uh, I mean, we have seen fleetingly such things. I mean, where we thought maybe this happened, um, but we have not looked into this, but certainly um, we will look into this and others will look into it. Um, because now, as I said, since we can localize with a nanometer or even less uh, precision, the question comes up, what happens if the molecule comes close? Um, are these still individual switchable molecules? And this is the requirement for taking pictures. I, as I explained many times, need to be individually switchable. This requisite prerequisite of individually switchable will break down at some point, yeah, I'm sure. There will be, I, I think for something that blinks, Alexa 647, I'm sure there is interaction. But for the, for, the, for the classical, say, activatable molecules, I would say that um, we might get away with it. We, we, we may not have problems. Right. And, and since we mentioned threat, maybe something that uh, um, also could be clarified again. So you mentioned the dipole, right? The, the dipole orientation that it has been a, yeah. it has been a burden in, in, in uh, single moiety localization because it could misplace. So, but you said in mean flux or the mean flux concept, this is uh, uh, the, this is a way. So, uh, if you can say, again explain again why, and and the second question is because I'm thinking about you what you refer to is if you have a dipole that is fixed during the the triangulation, and then the other situation if the dipole would rotate during the triangulation, what happened? Then it matters a bit, but it doesn't matter that much because um, because the zero is still a zero, mm -hmm. ideally. Okay. But the whole breaks down. The whole thing breaks down if there is there is substantial background, because then this this kind of makes the whole concept more uncertain. So so this is why I think um, in the end it's the background that will be. You never know the background that, that is the main thing one has to fight against, um, and not so much. Uh, I don't worry so much about the orientation because this is heavily suppressed by the nature of the concept. In palm storm or by the normal localization, it is. It is a major thing because if the molecule is oriented like this, it, it rests in this direction, and then the and then the, the pattern is shifted by a great amount. It's not a small thing; it's by a great amount. Um, if the molecule is slightly off the focal plane, and and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, people have tried, uh, but it's all cumbersome and and, and photo and costly, um, and it's it's not really working. But here, for fundamental reasons, that you do the majority of the of the localization, of course, with the photons that come from the laser, that of course gives you a lot of, lot of say precision to start with. You know, so that's the right mm. uh, thing. It gives a lot of precision to start with, and this is this is really a, a major benefit. All right. So I mean, maybe we so we have discussed the floor for we have discussed the concept of resolution and so on. Um, maybe you know the, the the last question could be like more for the future and say. Um, as long as there is a new technique, we all want everything, 3D multicolor uh, and so on. So how, how far is, for example, uh, like min flux to get to multicolor or, or? I mean, we have a paper in Nature Matters, as you certainly know, um, that where we should demonstrate two color imaging. Yeah. Um, uh, also two, um, uh, two colors in, in three dimensions. Um, of course, if you have a three dimensional donut and you split the photons over two colors and you have the separation, you will all, always have um, some some loss of precision. So, the, so of course, the precision that we showed in that uh, or that we published in that paper are not as precise as the 0.9. They are less. They are, they are something like three nanometers or so because of the fact that you have more um, that you have more constraints. But it can be done. And the purpose of of um, uh, of that demonstration of 3D and two colors is to show that this concept of min flux can be done, of course, on a large field of view, as many people doubted. And of course, it can be extended to 3D easier than people thought. And of course, it can also be extended to, to, um, uh, to multicolor. Um, again, if you the more constraints you put on it, the more photon costly it is. But, but as I said, the concept is the less photon greedy concept there is. And this is why um, it's going to be strong and it's going to stay because it's a fundamentally new and a fluorescent photon effective way of localizing molecules. And as I said, if you have a strong concept, it's going to stay. This is, this is what I've seen, and this cannot be dis dis uh, discussed away. Of course, some people may, may be unhappy with it. I understand that, 
but um, this is going to stay because the concept is so strong. Uh, that's very good. Yes. And, and, and my friend, my peers, uh, the neighboring lab working on labeling strategies are actually now probably parting for, for your, yeah. <laughs> what you that, said. That, you that get a great motivation. <laughs> that is the challenge. Yeah. If you have two independent switchable molecules coming very close, say 10 nanometers or less, what can take them apart? That, that's clear. That's, yeah. that, that wasn't clear, I, I would say, even five years back um, when it's realistic. No, it's realistic because yeah. you don't need 10,000 of photo from each. Right, so many good things to come. Thanks a lot, Stefan. You have been with us even longer than you promised, so uh, I will not take more of your time, but it has been a very great discussion. And yeah, looking forward for the next step. Yeah, thank you, Ilaria, and also the adage. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye, bye-bye. All the best.